I've been working on this Peco SA40. I've replaced a bunch of the capacitors. I've replaced all of the electrolytic capacitors, including those in the multi-cap here, which I emptied out and restuffed with normal electrolytics. Got a couple here down on the voltage doubler. I introduced a couple of dropping resistors here for the six volt supply and I replaced a bunch of resistors. Essentially everywhere that I found a resistor out of spec, I replaced that resistor and the resistor for the other channel in the same place in the circuit diagram. Just so they'd be more or less matching. A few remain. You can see a few of the original ones, but not many. Replaced most of the resistors. A few places, uh, you know, around here and around here where I started finding resistors out of spec, I simply replaced all of them. Okay, so, feeding in a signal here with the signal generator app on the phone. And we're looking at the output of one channel on the scope. And I'll show you the other channel, which doesn't look nearly as good. Now we're looking at about one watt output there. Okay, so you can see the problem here. Let me make it a little bigger, make it as big as the other channel. So it's, uh, it's clipped on the top there. I'll turn down the volume and we can see how it changes with level. So down here at one around one volt amplitude it's distorted but less so. Keep going down and we can see this voltage and I'd have to run the numbers to see what wattage that is but you know maybe it's still a little bit distorted because we can see the difference in the difference between a and b here versus here but it's certainly less distorted than when we turn the volume back up and it starts to actually clip right around here and becomes real obvious once we get up here into one watt territory. I should be able to do 20 watts easy. And in fact I keep turning this up Copacetic here. Now well, that's maximum volume, and I think the problem here is just the uh, the lo relatively low input from the phone. Okay, so where is the problem occurring? I can look at various spots. If you're not familiar with working on tube amps. You will notice that I'm only reaching with one hand. <clears throat> the other hand is literally in my lap. And that is the normal procedure working on an amp that is powered up. Because we've got 400 something volts on the B plus here. And that will kill you if it goes across your heart. FYI. Alright, let's look here at the signal in. And if the amp is arranged consistently, that should be the same input channel as we're looking at on the, as we were seeing. But, you know, just to make sure, we'll look at the other channel as well. You can see it looks fine. We'll look at the input to the AF amp. That's the channel that we're having problems with. Here's the good channel. 
So let's boost the amplitude to see. Careful, careful. I don't want to short anything. Okay, so they're, they're both looking the same on the input to the AF stage. So now let's see, I want to look at the output from the AF amp, which is the plate for the 7199 tube. That is the, the plate of the pentode half of the 7199 tube, and that should be pin 2. So here's the good channel up here. As we would expect, it's inverted. Looks good there. And they're not so good. Not dreadful, but you can see that the signal is asymmetric. Again, let's go back to the good channel. Okay. The RMS amplitude is 3.68 volts out of the first pentode or the AF pentode. And here it was 3.68 I said. So we can see it is significantly greater magnitude and asymmetric. So 5.75 volts now and the signal's wonky. We saw that the signal was fine coming in. That is So 93 millivolts, looking good. So looking symmetric. Again, remind ourself, ourselves that the other channel looks the same. And again, output of the AF stage on the other channel, three and two thirds volts. Output of the bad channel, yikes. So that would probably explain the clipping we're seeing. We're overdriving the next stage and so on. So that sucks. And that especially sucks because that might mean that I've got a bad 7199 tube. And that's really too bad because 7199 tubes are wicked expensive. What's the obvious thing to do? If we're not, if we're not sure whether it's the tube or something to do with the components, then we can switch the tubes and see if the problem follows the tube. Okay, so I've switched the tubes. We're looking at the outputs now. Same orientation of the probes as before. And we have the problem with the same channel as before. It's sort of a good news, bad news. The good news is we don't have a bad 7199 tube. And that's good news because 7199 tubes are very expensive. The bad news is we don't know what the problem is. It's nice when the problem's easier to solve, isn't it? Even if it's expensive to solve. Maybe the problem's not expensive to solve, but I've screwed up somewhere. Now i got to figure it out. All right. Well, having isolated the problem to that one tube, and specifically that pentode, or the pentode half of that 7199, each channel had one of these old capacitors. Now the one on the, the bad channel seemed to have the right capacitance, but the ESR was like off the charts. So whereas these new ones have ESR of like tens of ohms, let me show you what this one had. So yeah, it looks like the capacitance is about the right value. It's supposed to be a 33 nanofarad capacitor, and it's reading 34, but check out that ESR. This is 1.0 kilo ohms, something I don't really understand. The other one had way over value, which tends to indicate it's leaking, leaking DC. And look at the kilo ohms ESR on that, 2.8K. I don't know why this channel was just fine and dandy. I don't know, man. All I know is putting in the new film caps on each channel, and I got beautiful one watt. So now we can see just how far we might be able to jack that up and see what kind of power we can get out of this amplifier at one kilohertz. Okay, I'm gonna start jacking up the volume.
Start to hear the whine now. Yeah, I can't get it to full power with this phone. But well, let's see, six volts. Six squared, 36 over eight is uh, four point something watts. There's these ancient 68 picofarad capacitors in the feedback network. Their values tested fine. That would be a likely candidate for replacement. So that's maybe a good place to start. Um, and perhaps other places I've replaced these capacitors, but not the other. And I didn't replace the others because after I took these out and put them on the meter, it seemed to be just like perfect, but I haven't compared ESR values, so it may be that those need to be replaced. Again, it wouldn't hurt. Okay, just a bit of research online finds that these are not film capacitors, these are oil. Probably paper in oil, although they're encased in plastic. From what I gather, just kind of means, you know, they're just not going to be reliable. They may test and it may seem to operate okay with them, but it's just not going to be as nice as it could be with new film caps. You know, and there's some people who really just go like, it should all be original. It's like, are you freaking kidding me? This thing is literally, this amplifier was made in 1963. So we're literally talking 60 year old capacitors. Oil, paper and oil. So yeah, even though the values don't seem to be bad, I think I'm just gonna replace all of them and I, I will bet and I and again I don't I don't know what this grody looking thing here is, but sure couldn't hurt to replace that as well. And um I'm betting that that will make this amp pretty nice. So far so good though. So I replaced all the capacitors except for these ones here and here up on the front panel which are for the rumble filter and the contour filter and those are bypassed when those are off and they are off. So yeah, I got, got some nice uh, The capacitors I put in here, you can barely see because they're behind those big resistors, but they seem to spec pretty close to what was in there, so I don't know. Uh, anyway, here we go. We're at 20 hertz. Uh, let's put it up to 40. Pretty nice. Let's just bump it all the way up to one kilohertz now. in the phase, which is odd, but uh, right on one watt. Now I had to mess with the tone controls to get these extremes matched up like that. I don't know if the, if they're exactly centered or what, but in any case it's pretty flat right now. Anyway, I'm going to call this a success for now. 
the one thing I was thinking, oh yeah, I'd like to replace those capacitors. They're 0.015 microfarad or 15 nanofarad, and I don't have any of those. I could I could put together some 0.01s and some 0.0047s, but that's like double the cost of putting in the right value. So I'll order the right value and maybe replace those when I get around to it. Yeah, pretty nice. Ciao, everybody. Usually when I finish an amp like this, I would take it into my test rig. The test rig has like become cluttered. We're gonna listen to some Gino Vanelli, brother to brother. First, using the combination of the Phase Linear 4000 and the Beaver Valley. Wow, it's going to be hard to match the bass punch that the Beaver Valley has, but we shall see. One of the less lovely things about the Peco is that the inputs are all inside the chassis or inside the metal case on top of the chassis to reach in there. I don't know about you, but to me it's sounding a little thin on the bass. And I don't know how much of that is just that, you know, the Dynaco iron on the Beaver Valley is just friggin' amazing. Versus you know, maybe I need to mess with the bass here. So I'm gonna see if I can get that bass into the punchiness that I feel like I was hearing with the Beaver Valley. Now, some of that could also be down to the preamp. The, the Phase Linear 4000 has some features that, you know, the preamp here just doesn't. Solid state preamp with features, tube preamp without those features. I'm just going to play it again and play with the bass a little bit here. I was getting a little sibilance, so I turned the treble down and it's fine. I think I might have cranked it up a little louder than I did the Beaver Valley, I'm not sure. I'll find out when I edit the video. 
But I tell you what, you know, between the time when I last featured this amp in a video and I compared it, I believe it was to the NAD701 uh, receiver. And then, then I thought it was muted sounding. not sound muted now at all it's got a really bright sound actually and you know turn the bass up a bit not not very much just like you know a few notches sort of about one o'clock there and um yeah really got the floor shaking again <laughs> like i had with the beaver valley so i'm pretty pleased um you know little peco here is doing pretty well it doesn't seem to have as much power as uh, advertised. Um, it's called the SA40, which, you know, typically that means it's supposed to, I believe it is spec to supposedly have 20 watts per channel. Of course, that's 1963 measurements, uh, you know. When I cranked it up, both channels driven on the bench, I really was it's, it was struggling to get more than 10 watts per channel, which is about what the Beaver Valley can do. And that's interesting because it's got 7189 output tubes, and those are very similar to EL84s, but run at higher voltage. And the power supply in the Peco is, you know, like 400 something volts, as opposed to the power supply here, which is, fuck, I can't remember, 350 maybe. You know, and I think that's supposed to be able to get more wattage out of those similar tubes, but it's not. Now, I don't know if I might do some kind of enhanced fixed bias. I could probably get some more power out of it. Um, but I could also get more power out of the Beaver Valley if I did an, an enhanced fixed bias there as well. And if you're not familiar with enhanced fixed bias, that's a trademark of Dave Gillespie. Uh, you know, sort of the, the tube guru par excellence of Audio Karma. Anyway, you know, boy, doing a recap and re-resistor, because I changed almost, I didn't change all the resistors in there, but I changed the vast majority. And I changed almost all the capacitors. The only capacitors I didn't change are ones that are bypassed in the current setting anyway. And it's made a huge difference. Uh, you know, it was basically defective before. <laughs> I mean, really, it was defective uh, with the capacitors and, and resistors that it had. Because, you know, a lot of the resistors hadn't really gone out of spec, but some of them had. Some of them had gone way out of spec. And I suspect that a lot of the capacitors were really um, just doing a poor, poor job of what they're supposed to be doing. Although, you know, of those oil capacitors that I took out, they, you know, they all, almost all of them measured decently. Um, so it's a little confusing, the measurements versus performance. But um, anyway, film caps uh, for almost all of them. Uh, film caps for all of the oil ones previously, uh, one NPO C0G um, ceramic or a pair of, of those ceramics in the feedback network, um, all metal film resistors. So, uh, and of course, electrolytic capacitors. Cool. Well, I'm pretty psyched. So, just a, a little fixer-upper video. 
and a little ant comparison video for you. Have a good one, y'all. Try not to think just yet of me. Looking out into the sea.